So let's look at some of the very simple pieces of technology that differentiate Bluetooth from other technologies. So the first one to notice is that we use a time division multiplex uh, access to the media. So time is divided into 625 microsecond slots. And some people will talk about frames. A frame is two slots. So each slot is 625 microseconds. That means there's about 1,600 per second. And data is exchanged as packets lasting one or more slots. So we have some packets that are one slot long, some packets that are three so slots long, and some packets that are five slots long. And packets basically consist of a very simple structure. They have an access code, a header, and then some payload. And when we introduced extended data rate, or EDR, that increased the number of bits per symbol, then what we did was we had the same basic rate header, and then had a little guard time, another sync uh, section of the packet, and then the payload in the higher data rates. And that allowed us, in basic rate, to have a single pole packet going out from the master to all the slaves, which they could all synchronize on, uh, even if some of the devices couldn't support uh, EDR. And then there's two basic types of packet exchange. There's something called ACL, or the Asynchronous Connection Oriented Logical Transport, and there's something called SCO or ESCO, which is a synchronous connection oriented uh, transport. The best way to think of this is ACL is for data, and SCO and ESCO is for voice. That's the easy way to think of that. So how Bluetooth basic rate works is that one device starts looking for other devices. This is called discovery. To do that, it sends out what are known as ID packets. They're very, very short packets. They're about 72 microseconds long. And then one or more devices listen for these discovery packets. Those are devices that are discoverable. And when they receive one of these ID packets and want to respond, then they'll respond with an FHS packet, a frequency hop synchronization packet that just basically says, hi, I'm a device, my name is Robin. So the searching device might either continue looking for other devices, you know, it wants to populate a whole list on your, on your phone screen to say, you know, which headset do I want to connect to? And when I went to my hotel room to do this the other day, I found seven different Bluetooth devices, which is quite impressive to say that uh, this was before everybody had arrived. Or we could stop looking and then connect to that device because we've got enough information in that frequency hop synchronization packet to connect to that device. So in connection establishment, one device initiates the connection and they will always become the master of that connection. And the other device is to be willing to accept that connection. So the initiator uses something called paging to page the other device using an ID packet derived from that other device's address, which you got from the inquiry process. And then once that device hears that ID packet, then it replies. And then you basically have a PicoNet. And a PicoNet, as I said, in the basic rate, is one master and up to seven slaves. So here we've got one master with one slave, and then further along we've got one master with three slaves. The master always controls the communication. The master is in control of the timing and who is spoken to. There is no slave-to-slave -slave communication. If you want to send data from one slave to another slave, you cannot do that in basic rate. And the master, therefore, also has to make sure that the slave devices aren't starved of time. You've, what I mean by that is, your master has to continuously poll those slaves to give them an opportunity to talk. Now, one of the things I talked about at the beginning when we went through that big table was Scatternet. And Scatternet is where we join one or more PCONets together. So here we actually have two masters, Master M1 and Master M2. So Master M2 has three slaves, slave four, slave five, slave six. Master M1 has three slaves, uh, slave one, slave two, slave three. But master two is also got another slave, which is the same device as master one. So you can see that these PicoNets can expand and basically take over the world into whole huge scatternet scenarios. 
So as you can see, we've got one device here that is a member of two different Piconets. The M1 device is the master of its own Piconet, but also the slave of another Piconet. But again, there's no direct communication between the slaves. So master one can't talk directly to slave four, slave five, or slave six. It has to go through master two to be able to transmit some data. Interference management is one of the big key benefits that Bluetooth brings to the world of wireless communication. A lot of wireless technologies use a single frequency, which is great until somebody else decides to use that same frequency. You know, it, it's like when they build a new freeway. It's absolutely fantastic for the first few days because nobody else knows the freeway there. And then they get to find out and then they use your lane and get in the way. It's just what happens in the 2.4 gigahertz world. But what Bluetooth has done is it's built a very, very wide freeway and the ability to switch between lanes very, very quickly to find the lane that is actually the freest at this point in time. So it's designed to reduce interference between wireless technologies, not only Bluetooth with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth with Zigbee or Bluetooth with your X10 video repeater or Bluetooth with some proprietary technology, but also the other way around so that we don't get interfered with by other technologies. So it works by basically examining what frequencies are being used, which frequencies are having interference, which frequencies have a low signal to noise ratio, and then communicating which channels to use and which channels not to use. And this provides users with the optimum transmission performance, even if other technologies are using the same spectrum. And one of the great things about this is it's incredibly robust. There was a, uh, a customer of ours who had a Bluetooth device at the end of a welding arm in a factory. And when you look at welding arms, they are pretty horrible from an interference point of view. They are more like a spark gap than anything else. And it worked. They had a requirement that only 2% of packets could be, could be lost. And they actually worked out that the packet loss rate was two packets in a million. That's pretty damn good. As I said, there's two basic types of channels. So there's ACL channels and SCO channels. In ACL or asynchronous connectionless channels, these are used for data connections. So when you're transferring your phone book or whether you're trying to say, yes, answer the call, or when you're trying to play high quality music, you're using an ACL channel. The throughput can be best thought of as best effort. So while you may want to send that data now. The radio will use best efforts to get it through, but if there's something more important going on, like for example, a Wi-Fi device in the same piece of hardware is trying to synchronize with a Wi-Fi beacon, which is pretty critical to make Wi-Fi work, then it may delay the ACL data going so that you can keep the Wi-Fi network up. And that's not a problem. And there's many, many different types of packets. As I said, there's one slot packets, there's three slot packets, there's five slot packets. Some of them have uh, forward error correction, which allows even longer range. Some of them do not. SCO packets, on the other hand, are used for voice data. And the real key here is that they are literally timed to occur at a periodic interval. And they always occur on a periodic interval, which means you can guarantee the latency of that voice link. And this is really, really important. If you don't do that, then your latencies just grow and grow and grow to the worst possible scenario. So if you've got, say, a Wi-Fi chip in the same device and you're trying to do high, um, you know, uh, audio for voice over an ACL link, you'd have to time those latency around what's the maximum time that Wi-Fi could disrupt me or something else could disrupt me. Where by using SCO and ESCO, you can make sure that you've got exactly the latency you require. So it uses what are known as reserved time slots so that you can then transmit the data and know exactly when that data is going to go across. With SCO, there are basically 
uh, four different packet types, HV1, HV2, HV3, that are sent at different periods. ESCO was something that we brought in in the 1.2 specification, and that allowed us to vary the latency and the amount of data that is included in a packet. And that's helping us tremendously when we're trying to do coexistence with, for example, LTE radios. So here, we've actually got a large number of different packet types, and we can actually include an awful lot of information in those. And if you look at, for example, hands-free profile version 1.5, you'll see there's a table in there that describes different setting configurations for ESCO to get the best possible performance. The other thing about BR, EDR, is that we have this concept of a power class. We have three power classes, class one, class two, and class three. Class three is typically not used anymore, but it is still in the specification. So class three is anything below zero dBm transmit power, which is less than one milliwatt. Class two is anywhere from minus six to plus four dBm. And this is between 250 microwatts and 2.5 milliwatts. So very, very low power. The reason for class two is that it's below all the regulatory environments and you don't have to do power control. Class one is up to 20 dBm, which is about 100 milliwatts. So that's basically the same as Wi-Fi, but you have to do power control. Now, power control is useful anyway, because if you've got two devices that are pretty close to each other, like, so, for example, your cell phone and some speakers, then you want to reduce the amount of power that you transmit so that you can reduce the interference with other devices. It actually helps interference by lowering your transmit power. Another way of looking at this is not in terms of what the transmit power is, but what is the range that you could expect. So class one, you could expect to get about 100 meters worth of range. With class two, you can get about 10 meters worth of range, about 9.8 if we're being exact. And with class three, you get less than 10 meters. High speed was a technology that was introduced with version 3.0 of the specification. And this leverages other radio technologies, other physical layers. And the first technology we did for that was something called ATA211, uh, the IEEE specification, not Wi-Fi. So this allows us to be backwards compatible with other Bluetooth devices. But if both devices have this alternate Mac Phi infrastructure, then when you're transferring a large file, like the whole of your phone book or something like that, or album art when you get into a car and you want to see what album art is uh, being played, then you can turn on this alternate radio, configure that radio, set up all the security, send the data across, and then disconnect that very, very quickly. It's still Bluetooth. It may use another radio from the IEEE, but it's still Bluetooth. It's still using the same Bluetooth profiles, the same Bluetooth service discovery. All of those good things that Bluetooth does, we are still using. The most interesting thing about that is that you have probably used high speed, but you don't even know it. That's one of the sad things about high speed is that at no point do you have something flash up on your screen saying, I'm now using high speed Bluetooth. It doesn't do that. It just works. <laughs>